Hello and welcome to another episode of Jenny's Chateau Farm. Today I thought it was time that I shared with you some of the long and varied history of this house. And if there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the previous owners because there's some interesting stories among them. When I started looking into the history of this house, I was more than a little bit surprised to find strong links both to my husband's native Sweden and to the United States of America, most notably Texas, where my grandmother lived for many years. In this location, there has been a village since at least medieval times when a Romanesque church was built and along with it a seigneury or feudal domain that was allocated to a lord. By 1378, the lords of Vaux had the right to high, medium and low justice. In other words, they could charge a toll for people using their roads and could act as judge and jury in any disputes, which may even include giving the death penalty to those that served them. In turn, they paid homage to the Count of Jarnac in the form of money and 10 days guard duty each year. Somewhat optimistically, my husband was rather hoping that these privileges would come with the house when we bought it. However, so far, he's been rather unsuccessful in reinstating these rights. By the 14th century, the Seigneury of Vaux was a defensive stronghold belonging to the Geoffroy family. But in 1450, it was sold to the Montalembert family, who maintained it for more than 300 years. These were difficult times, however, and in 1530, an epidemic of the plague struck the village, which resulted in the villagers abandoning homes on this hillside and rebuilding them across the valley around the chateau. By 1648, Jacques de Montalembert was the Lord of Vaux. As a Protestant, this Lord paid little attention to the church or the local cemeteries. And despite numerous complaints from the clergy, he decided to seize the stones from the ruins of the church, the local presbytery, and the stones and crosses of four cemeteries in order to expand and rebuild his chateau. The right to such abuse of power, including of high, medium, and low justice, were for centuries the object of numerous lawsuits and controversies between the laws of Jarnac and their vassals. By 1752, the Lord of Vaux held only low and medium justice and paid a duty to the Count of Jarnac in the form of silver to the value of 18 livres. Soon after this time, Jacques de Montalembert's grandson, Marc René, Marquis de Montalembert, sold the chateau in 1759 to Pierre Van Tongeren, who was the treasurer of France. He was from a Flemish family of paper merchants who, like many other of their compatriots, had settled in Angoulême. His son, Alexandre van Tongeren, was probably the last Lord of Vaux, because by 1789 the French Revolution had started and soon after the Chateau Vaux was largely destroyed by fire. Only the dovecote and the longer and the external walls remain to this century. After the revolution, the Seigneury of Vaux was renamed Vaurouillac in 1801, and in the survey of the Napoleonic land registration in 1832, the remains of Chateau Vaux could still be clearly seen. However, they must have lain largely abandoned for a generation, because it was not until 1851 that the current building, the Logis de Bakou, was constructed. Its style of architecture was considered modern in its time. Constructed in a neoclassical Regency style, the emphasis was on sobriety, straight lines, symmetry, colonnades and columns, inspired in part by reports of the archaeological excavations of Roman settlements at Herculaneum and Pompeii. Indeed, the carving on the triangular pediment on the front of the house gives the logis its name, as it features the face of Baku, the Roman version of the Greek god Dionysos, the god of wine and winemaking. 
neoclassicism's popularity at the time was in part a reaction to the perceived frivolity and excessive ornamentation of the Baroque and Rococo styles that had been so popular with the aristocracy, whose excesses and abuse of power had been overthrown by the revolution. Although the old chateau lay abandoned and in ruin next to the Logis, in 1865 it was described as having had some very vast apartments and crenulated turrets that still remain. The Logis de Bacchus was constructed to be a viticole, or cognac and wine producing estate. However, just 20 years after it was completed, disaster struck. In 1870, almost all the vineyards in this region were ravaged by phylloxera, an aphid native to Northeast America that was imported on the newly built steamships whose speed allowed it to survive the Atlantic crossing. With their crops decimated, French wine producers took many years to meticulously rebuild their wine industry. Ironically, with the help of phylloxera resilient rootstock, also imported from America. One of the men credited with saving the French wine industry was Texan Thomas Volney Munson. In 1888, the French government sent a delegation to Denison, Texas to award him the Légion d'honneur for his work in importing Phylloxa resilient rootstock to France. I was particularly interested to learn this fact because my grandmother used to live in Denison, Texas, and I spent many summers there in my youth. Despite the Phylloxera epidemic, it seemed the Van Tongeren family were still reasonably successful in their endeavours perhaps because they'd switched to mixed farming, breeding animals, and growing tobacco for cigars. Because by 1879, they were able to commission this large arch built in stone at the entrance to the Logis, with the inscription built by Compagne F, 1879. By 1909, the Logis de Bacchus was purchased by the family from whom we bought it and it housed four generations of that family, producing cognac and tobacco. Some of them still live in the village and are still producing cognac. You will meet them soon because they've become our very dear friends. In 1910, the Marie, the local village school, was built just next to the Logis, and by 1950, every household in the village had internal running water. The next family to add to the history of the house is us. So now that you're more or less up to date, I'm going to take a little break, make a cup of tea, and then we'll sit down and I'll tell you all about one of the most prominent previous owners of the house, the Marquis de Montalembert. Marc René de Montalembert was born on the 16th of July, 1714, and he died on the 29th of March, 1800. Marc René de Montalembert was a military engineer and writer and was known for his work in designing fortifications and for founding the cannon factory at Rue Sautouvre. The site of the Rue foundry is now owned by the Naval Group, a European leader in naval defence, serving 18 countries and the strategic operation of more than 50 navies. In 1753, the cannon forge was created for the manufacture of cannons for the King's Navy. The guns were transported to the port of Le Mans in Angoulême, seven kilometres away, where they embarked on the Chouant River to arm ships at the Royal Navy Arsenal in Rochefort, La Rochelle, Bordeaux and beyond. 
To this day, the work of the Rue Foundry is celebrated by the organisation of the Rue de Tonon et des Canons, who reenact the movement of the barrels and the cannons from the forges to the Atlantic Sea via the Charonde River, and they organise a forge and metallurgy festival each year. In order to deliver the cannons from the forges to their places of intended use, huge naval cannons and vast quantities of barrels full of supplies, historically intended for the ramparts of Quebec and elsewhere, had to travel on wagons pulled by horses and mules and were accompanied along the route by an impressive parade of peasant workers in the service of the forges. All these workers were essential to the construction of the Ponant fleet. During the Seven Years' War, between 1756 to 1763, the Marquis de Montalembert was sent first to the Swedish and then to the Russian armies to play the role of advisor and military expert. Marc-René Montalembert died in Paris on March 29, 1800, at the age of 85. Dean of Generals and member of the Academy of Sciences. His statue can still be found outside his foundry in Rue.